the underlords of nature. They are controlling and designing the ecosystems for the best benefit of the plurality of the community to best preserve biodiversity and sustainability. So they do not look and operate in terms of their own lifetimes, but in the time, in, with the framework of successionism, for the benefit of the commons and the biodiversity of the community, which gives the ecosystem diversity and resiliency and sustainability. They are truly organisms that we can all learn from. Mushrooms. Yeah! Wow! Oh, it's so liberating. Here we are coming out of the psychedelic closet. Paul Stamets, my brother, come on up here. Shed your light, shed your wisdom. I freaking love you. Yes! Psilocybin mushroom. Well, thank you, Stephen. I want to give a shout out and deep gratitude to the Costa Rican uh, people especially the indigenous people of the new world who welcome uh, many of us Europeans. You know, we're very deeply grateful forever for your generosity and kindness and uh, helping us uh, survive. So we have a debt of gratitude to the indigenous peoples of the Americas. Let's make sure we pay. We are at a revolution. So I hope that you all can join this. So. I'm going to launch into this. At the very end of this, I'm going to empower all of you. Testing. <laughs> I'm going to try to empower all of you with the knowledge that you can grow your own psilocybin mushroom patch in your backyard. You, you will be mycologically independent of anyone else. Because on that panel yesterday, when I was speaking about the use of psilocybin mushrooms, for me, um, <laughs> the least toxic of all psychotropic substances that have ever been tested. So this has given the FDA confidence uh, to approve clinical studies, because you can imagine all the clinical studies that have been approved for those other substances which are much more toxic than psilocybin. I populate this website called mushroomreferences.com. I primarily constructed this because many of the doctors and physicians that we place our confidence in, because they're higher authorities in the science of medicine, oftentimes were totally uneducated about the properties of medicinal mushrooms and psilocybin mushrooms. This is an unbranded labor of love for the commons. There is hundreds and hundreds of references. So go to mushroomreferences.com. This is written primarily for physicians, researchers, and graduate students and also for what I call the intellectually curious. So um, I populate this once a week. I'm a victim of Google Scholar alerts. I put in too many keywords. I get too many articles. I gotta read them. So I call those and I, I populate just, um, you know, this website um, for public benefit and I update it about once a week. We are primates. And the Golgi monkey um, of Bolivia consumes more than 12 times its body weight in a mushroom called Ascopoliparus. It's a lower cannibal, it can be a monkey growing in the Bolivian Amazon, but this mushroom uh, is an absolute key uh, food for the Golgi monkeys. Now, this is the most highest mushroom consumption species that we know of, but this also speaks to the fact that there's 23 primates consuming mushrooms. That speaks to a very long um, evolutionary history with primates understanding that mushrooms are excellent as foods and as medicines. About two million years ago, our ancestors' brain suddenly enlarged. Homo sapiens only appeared evolutionarily 200,000 years ago. That's not very long ago. 40,000 years ago, Homo sapiens migrated from Africa. We are all Africans, genetically. We all came from Africa. Here's our primate ancestors walking across the savanna. They're hungry, they're a family, they're a tight clan. They come across, they find scat, dung. The largest mushroom growing out of dung is Psilocybe cubensis. 
Due to the our ancestors, hungry, most primates eat grub. Grub grows uh, from larvae and mushrooms. You can sit in the mushrooms. 20 minutes later, you have liftoff. <laughs> In your catapult rhythm into an extrasensory, extraordinary experience that results in neurogenesis, the creation of new neurons, new synaptic junctions, new ways of thinking, new ways of imagining. And this was then speculated as the reason why the skull enlarged was the, in order to accommodate the increase of the, of brain mass that was, that was forming within. And so external stimuli influence how proteins are coded and how your DNA elaborates. And so we develop new genomic expressions that give you an added advantage, then those expressions then are coded and it becomes part of your genome. So this strikes me, and now as we understand better epigenetic theory, and then some of the most recent research that's come out in the past four or five years on psilocybin and neurogenesis, I think Terrence and, and Dennis got it right. I think, um, no. so here is the, the great late uh, Terrence McKenna in the Stone Date Theory, and a great uh, painting by our friend Alex Gray. Uh, Alex and Allison Gray are two psychonaut friends of ours, and it speaks to glossinalia, the ability of you to create language. And the idea, and then the psilocybin influence is that your inventiveness and creativity, not only in, in skill sets and tool making and visioning, but your ability to articulate, to see the in, ineffable, to see suddenly this massive fractalization. How are you going to communicate that to your family member, to your loved one? Many of us, in, in, under the influence, we turn to our friends and our partners and they go, and we go, do you see what I'm seeing? And they go, yes, we see it, you know? So it's, a, it's something that's a bridge that really bonds the family units and friends together. So let's look at something that Terrence and Dennis McKenna proposed, uh, the stoned ape theory. Now the stoned ape theory uh, w th was a speculative idea, not necessarily rooted in um, paleontological facts, and I have to admit myself, it was a good stoner conversation at night around the table. Um, but increasingly, I think this theory needs to be re-examined. And to the credit of uh, Terrence and Dennis McKenna, I want to give a shout out to them. My hypothesis is that educated guess, not, not necessarily uh, explained by verbal phenomenon. A theory is a hypothesis that's been tested by science and facts that support it. This hypothesis, I think, is becoming a theory. Uh, because now we can test psilocybin and brain neurons and some of the, the information I'm going to show you uh, today was first revealed at Stanford Medical School uh, at, a, at a conference that I just recently attended. So you're the first group you know, outside of the, of the medical uh, uh, scientists, universities that will be seeing this information. Since time is short, I'm going to go through these very quickly. These are some meta studies, 480,000 people uh, that through surveys, these were prisoners, and association necessarily is not ca ca causation, but it can be. So in disambiguation of this data, these results are pretty profound. If you've had one use of psilocybin mushrooms by these, these in this prisoner survey, there's a 27% decrease odds of past year larceny and theft, 22% decrease of uh, uh, odds for property crime, and an 18% decrease odds for a violent crime. Think of that. Now, another study came out, 1,266 community members, and there was a dramatic draw, a drop in partner-to-partner -partner violence. Interestingly, localized with men. So if your partner, your male partner, had had one psilocybin experience, they were less likely, statistically significantly less likely to have uh, to commit partner-to-partner -partner violence. So I thought on the dating apps, for you young people, <laughs> have you ever tripped on psilocybin? Yes, hey, I'm gonna... <laughs> that if they took these psilocybin mushrooms, addressed these issues, then months, years later, when they re-reflected on their psilocybin mushroom session, it over wrote, so to speak, 
the PTSD uh, code and they no longer have PTSD associated, again, for that firecracker, they associated their mushroom experience. So it replaced the association of the conditioned fear response with a positive experience. That is unprecedented in psychiatry. There's an increased nature relatedness and a decreased authoritarian political views. Well, that's interesting. That's kind of a pro-democracy, you know, influence on society. So you have decreased criminalization or decreased the, uh, criminal activity, and you have a decreased uh, influence by authoritarian figures that, that um, I can think of a few people right now that could benefit from this. A lion's mane. It stimulates nerve growth factors, hericinones and aranaceans. The aranaceans come from the mycelium, the hercinones come from the mushrooms. It's the aranaceans that are specifically, specifically very powerful, uh, showing significant uh, benefits as long as the patients continue to take lion's mane, about two to four grams per day uh, in a capsule form. So these studies, uh, continue, the benefits continued as long as the people continued taking the lion's mane. These people were identified on a steady climb towards demen dementia, and pre-Alzheimer's, and as long as they continued to take uh, the mushrooms they benefited, after the study and the, after the treatment period was over, they then re resumed that decline into dementia. I suggest four days on, you know, two to three days off. Um, James and I compare notes. I said, how did you come up with your protocol? And, and he goes, well, how did you come up with yours? And I said, I made it up. And he goes, he did too. So the idea with military comment is to watch the receptors so they renormalize so they resensitize so your endogenous you know uh, uh, pathways uh, are, are not conditioned upon an external stimulus so you can be able to keep the natural pathways intact is something that is just truly revolutionary in its simplicity is stem butts regrow psilocybin stem butts regrow the mushrooms if you pick them and you throw them into the ground they'll rot but the stem butts don't. So you take a stem butt here of the garden giant, you can cut it, and then you can take the stem butts of a psilocybin mushroom, and you need fuzzy feet, stem butts. The stem butts with all those rhizomorphs and hairs. Now, animals don't eat the stem butts. They go and deer and pick up the mushrooms, they bite the mushrooms, they drop the stem butts. Maybe this is why stem butts have evolved to regrow. And the stem butts are immunologically educated to the microbiome. This is really important. It's not the baby in the bubble syndrome. You're not using a laboratory. You're just collecting wild mushrooms and you trim off the stem butts and then you put it into cardboard that's been soaked. You wrap it up in a piece of cardboard and two weeks later, the stem butts regrow into mycelium. And then you have the mycelium running on cardboard. You can also inoculate wooden dowels with stem butts. And there's a specific technique about this. Gracias, gracias. Are we losing our screen? It's raining. It's raining. Oh, it's perfect for mushrooms. Okay. <laughs> Let it rain. Let it rain. A beautiful song coming on. Yeah. You put the, uh, the stem butts then uh, in a in a cardboard box out back, and four months later. Look how tenacious that mycelium is. Then you can use that mycelium to inoculate. And now here is a short minute and a half video. I'm not sure if you, can you guys see it or not? No? Okay. So in this video, basically this is what you do. I can just tell you. You just end up putting wood chips into water or straw. If you're growing psilocybe cubensis, you use straw. If you're growing psilocybe cymescens, azurescens, you know, other than these wood chip psilocybes, you go, you put it in the, in the uh, alder or conifer chips. Don't use cedar, don't use redwood, don't use juniper. You put wood chips underwater in a tub. You let it soak for two weeks. You let it go anaerobic. A bacterial slime will form on top. It goes anaerobic because lack of oxygen. Anaerobes become predominant. They, the wood chips absorb the water and then you drain the wood chips of the water, put it out on a little plastic tarp, and oxygen becomes a sterilizer and it kills the anaerobes. 
Now you have that mycelium that I showed you and you inoculate the wood chips and the mycelium grows out like crazy. And so you have not used a laboratory, you use uh, naturally occurring mushrooms with those fuzzy butts. You put those fuzzy butts directly then into the soaked wood chips that you've exposed to air. Air kills the anaerobes, the mycelium runs like crazy and you create a mycelial lens. And so five or six stem butts can inoculate about the size of this table and that's year one. Year two, you must keep the mycelium running. So you have to expand it. So typically you expand it in between March and April for fruitings in October. But you create these mycelial lenses that you can then repetitively expand and they're immunologically educated so they're incredibly strong in their immune system for being able, for, so you can create a mushroom patch in your backyard. So this is a type of liberation mycology. You don't have to buy from any business. You tie yourself directly to your sacrament. It's extremely under the radar. And then how often do you really need to imbibe in these mushrooms? I only imbibe in them once or twice a year. Um, so for making your own, for your family, a small little mushroom patch means you're not buying from a drug dealer, you know, or, you know, or somebody else you don't know where the mushrooms came from. It ties you into the biology and the mycology of the consciousness of psilocybin. Folks, I want to thank you very much. I just want to say, this is a revolution. Thank you so much, Paul.